Welcome to Atmos 5000 Day 18. Our objectives today are taken from Stoll Chapter 7, Section 7.1 and 7.2, and we're moving into the application of our thermodynamics to the topic of precipitation formation. And we'll start off with a cloud physics module overview. Then we'll start talking about uh, supersaturation, where the relative humidity is greater than 100%. We'll introduce the concept of cloud condensation nuclei, which are the particles that cloud droplets form on. And then we'll talk about the physics of condensation and how that is impacted by the curvature of droplets and also by impurities in the droplets. And we'll be referring to those as the curvature effect and the solute effect. And then we'll introduce the critical radius supersaturation necessary for a haze droplet to be turned into a cloud droplet. We're beginning a new section uh, in this class. Recall that this class, uh, the first quarter of this class was thermodynamics. The second quarter will be cloud microphysics. The third quarter will be atmospheric radiation. And the fourth quarter will be uh, fluid dynamics. I'd like to give you an overview of where we're headed with the cloud microphysics to give you the big picture so that we don't get lost in the minutia. Uh, in the atmosphere, and in fact in this room, uh, there are particles uh, in this room. Uh, we call these particles uh, condensation nuclei because every one of them could theoretically uh, be a source of a seed for a cloud droplet to form. And so we refer to them as condensation nuclei. Uh, they generally range in size between uh, 0.01 micrometers and 10 micrometers. Uh, we can have particles that are larger than 10 micrometers in the atmosphere, uh, but the gravitational settling velocity is so high that their lifetime in the atmosphere is only a few hours. Contrast that, the small size of the particles, with the size of the cloud droplets. Uh, the droplets in the clouds that you see um, generally range between 10 and 100 micrometers uh, in diameter. Uh, and uh, they're composed of liquid water. Uh, and e every single cloud droplet will have at least one uh, particle inside it that served as an embryo for the formation of that droplet. And then you can contrast that with the size of a rain droplet, uh, which is huge. Um, it's uh, anywhere from one millimeter uh, all the way up to six millimeters. Um, and there's a physical reason why droplets don't get much larger than six millimeters, because at that point, the direct forces are so large uh, on the rain droplet that they actually start to split apart and break apart in flight. So the ultimate question that we're trying to answer in this uh, section of the course is how do you grow um, a rain droplet from a particle and gas in the atmosphere, water vapor in the atmosphere, in about an hour. Because that's the observation of how long it takes for a cloud to form before it can begin to precipitate. And so we have to come up with the uh, mathematical description of this entire process so that we can quantitatively uh, identify how this process moves forward, at what rate it moves forward, and uh, at what rate this, these dro droplets actually grow. So, big picture. We're going to start off with the observed structure of clouds. What do clouds actually look like from a scientific perspective, from measurements that are taken from aircraft that are flying through clouds? Um, next, we'll talk about the physics of condensation. Why does water vapor in the atmosphere ever want to condense onto a uh, condensation nuclei? Uh, what is the physics of that condensation process and what makes it a spontaneous process? Uh, we'll introduce the concept of the curvature effect, um, which basically says for a pure water droplet, the saturation vapor pressure over that uh, pure water droplet that's curved uh, is actually uh, going to be greater uh, than that of a plain surface of pure water. And that has implications on the droplet growth process. Uh, then we'll talk about the solute effect and introduce Kohler curves, uh, which uh, basically reduce the equilibrium saturation vapor pressure for uh, cloud droplets by, by adding impurities into the droplets. 
um, will identify which of the uh, particles in the atmosphere, which of the cloud con of the condensation nuclei in the atmosphere are actually good seeds for the droplet growth, and we refer to those as cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, these are the embryos on which the, uh, the droplets actually form. And then once we have this ba background in order, then we can develop an equation that describes the growth of a um, cloud droplet by uh, vapor diffusion. Um, and then we'll start to look at a, a different type of growth mechanism, which is the collision coalescence mechanism, where droplets are falling through the atmosphere at different terminal velocities and overtake one another and collide and uh, coalesce. And so we have to, at first, figure out what is the terminal velocity of the droplets, uh, what is their collision efficiency, and what is their collection efficiency once they actually hit. Uh, then we can develop a model that will describe the growth rate uh, uh, by collision coalescence mechanism. And we can compare that growth rate from collision coalescence to the growth rate by vapor diffusion and understand which uh, of these mechanisms is primarily responsible for the uh, formation of the cloud droplets. And then, uh, everything up to this point has been in a warm phase, which means liquid water, but we know that these clouds uh, often extend to altitudes where the temperature is below freezing, and then we'll start to talk about what happens when these clouds start to glaciate, or they start to turn to ice. And so we'll uh, talk a little bit about the ice crystal formation process and the different types of habits, which are the different types of ice crystals that can form in the atmosphere. Uh, and then we will introduce a simplified version of the vapor diffusion equation uh, that has been simplified for uh, very regularized ice crystals. Uh, and at that point, uh, we can start to look at the relative growth rate uh, by ice crystal mechanism, by collision coalescence, and by vapor diffusion. And you'll have a pretty good idea at that point about how we can actually grow a rain droplet from particles in a relatively short period of time, in the order of an hour or so. So now that you have an overview of cloud microphysics and where we're headed, we're going to introduce the concept here of supersaturation and water availability. Supersaturation we denote with a capital S, and that's going to be equal to the water vapor pressure divided by the saturation vapor pressure minus one. So, <clears throat> and that's equivalent to your relative humidity minus 100, or the water vapor mixing ratio R over R sub S minus one. And then we also have what we call the uh, water availability, RE, which is the water vapor ratio, R, uh, minus the R sub S. Uh, and that is going to be equivalent to the uh, RL, which is the water vapor, excuse me, the liquid water mixing ratio, plus RI, which is the uh, ice mixing ratio, and this equation is true for R, water vapor mixing ratio greater than the saturation value. Um, so um, the excess water vapor that's available can be turned into liquid water and or ice. The supersaturations, uh, the way that this is defined, uh, is a transient state uh, that leads to condensation or deposition. Uh, the supersaturations with respect to liquid water are typically very small, and supersaturations with respect to ice are greater than supersaturations with respect to liquid water. So what are cloud condensation nuclei? Well, we have lots of particles in the atmosphere. Uh, these particles range in size from a few nanometers up to uh, a tens of micrometers in diameter. And so cloud condensation nuclei is a subset of all of the particles in the atmosphere. And they're typically found in the range of 1 to 10 micrometers in diameter. They can be a little bit smaller if they happen to have the right chemical properties. These cloud condensation nuclei particles are suspended in the air. And not all particles are good cloud condensation nuclei. The good cloud condensation nuclei 
uh, include large particles and particles that are water soluble. And these include uh, sea salt, sulfate, nitrate, and mineral dust. Mineral dust is not water soluble, but it's a large particle, so it can act as a good cloud condensation nuclei as well. And just to summarize there, the best cloud condensation nuclei are large particles and water soluble particles. So let's compare a marine environment out over the oceans versus a continental environment. So out over the oceans, it's relatively clean and the number of particles per cubic centimeter typically falls in the 100 to 1,000 particles per cubic centimeter range. Uh, contrast that with over the continents, where we have a lot of natural sources of particles, but we also have a lot of human uh, sources of particles. Uh, the particle concentrations range uh, typically between 1,000 and 300,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And as I said before, cloud condensation nuclei, CCN, are a subset of the particle concentrations. And in the marine environment, uh, more than 50% of all the particles uh, typically act as cloud condensation nuclei. And so that leads us to the conclusion that uh, cloud condensation nucleus concentrations over the marine environment are typically between 50 and 100 uh, cloud condensation nuclei per cubic centimeter. As opposed to the continental uh, situation where a much smaller fraction of the particles act as cloud condensation nuclei, mostly because these particles are smaller in size. And uh, typically speaking, the cloud condensation nuclei concentrations over the continents uh, range between 100 and 1,000 a CCN per cubic centimeter. So this leads us to the question as does the change in the cloud condensation nucleus concentrations between the marine environment and the continental environments have any ramifications on the formation of large cloud droplets which we need to begin the precipitation process? And the answer is yes. If we have a certain amount of liquid water available, if we divide that liquid water among 100 droplets, uh, that would be your marine environment. But if you take that same amount of liquid water and divide it among 1,000 droplets, as you might in a continental scenario, the continental uh, cloud droplets are going to be smaller than the marine uh, cloud droplets. And as it turns out, this has big ramifications on the likelihood of individual clouds to rain. Marine clouds, almost all of them will produce precipitation within a pretty short time of a few hours. Whereas continental clouds, most of the continental clouds do not precipitate, and the ones that do often are the ones that have ice in them. And we'll talk about why the presence of ice would increase the likelihood of precipitation in continental clouds as we move further into the module. So the answer to this is which type of cloud is likely to have bigger droplets? It's going to be the marine clouds. And as a result, which type of cloud is more likely to rain? It's going to be the marine clouds again. So <clears throat> thus far, we've defined a supersaturation and a relative humidity relative to a plain surface of pure water. And the equation that we used to describe the saturation vapor pressure under those conditions was the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. But with cloud droplets and haze droplets, we're trying to form a stable matrix of water droplets that are no longer uh, in a plane surface, but rather are in the shape of a sphere um, that has a curved surface. And that curved surface actually reduces the strength of the intermolecular forces that hold the water molecules together, which makes it easier for an individual water molecule to escape 
uh, from the liquid phase and move to the gas phase through the process of evaporation. And because of this uh, reduction in the intermolecular forces, it actually increases the saturation vapor pressure over a curved surface relative to a plane surface of pure water. And so here we're looking at the same situation in a slightly different way. We're looking at the relative humidity that is required to, for a curved surface to be at equilibrium with the environment. So as the droplet, uh, on this case, the x-axis, the droplet radius gets bigger, <clears throat> as it uh, gets beyond one micrometer or so, you can see that the relative humidity required to uh, maintain uh, a droplet and prevent it from evaporating uh, basically asymptotes out to 100% relative humidity. <clears throat> But as you move to smaller and smaller droplets, the curvature effect um, makes them more likely to evaporate. <clears throat> so in order to compensate for that, you have to have a much, much higher relative humidity in order for that curved surface to be at equilibrium with the environment. And by the time you get down to a radius of 0.01 micrometers, you need a relative humidity that is about 113 percent. And just so for comparison purposes, the relative humidity in the atmosphere rarely gets above about uh, 101 or 101.5 percent. What that means is that small water droplets of pure water do not exist in the Earth's atmosphere, and we have to come up with an alternative way for cloud droplets or cloud droplet embryos to form. So here we have an equation to describe the saturation vapor pressure over a curved surface of droplet uh, with a radius uh, capital R. So uh, we have E sub S of T of R, so the saturation vapor pressure uh, as a function of temperature and as a function of the droplet radius R is equal to E sub S of T. So that is the saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of pure water determined from the Clausius-Clapeyron equation or uh, Teton's formula. And to adjust that saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of water to a curved surface, we have to multiply by this exponential term, which is the exponent of two, uh, supposed to be two sigma, over R sub V rho L T R, uh, where R sub V is the uh, specific gas constant for water vapor, rho L is the density of liquid water, uh, T is the temperature, and R is the droplet radius. Or we can also uh, describe this as E sub S of T, which is your water uh, vapor pressure over a the saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of pure water times the exponent of two sigma over rho m, uh, which is uh, 3.3 times 10 to the 28 molecules per meter cubed, um, times Kb, uh, which is the uh, Boltzmann constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per K per molecule, and then times temperature and relative, uh, and the droplet radius R. We can use this equation to determine the equilibrium radius for a pure water droplet by just rearranging it and solving for R. Uh, we do that, we get the equilibrium radius of a pure water droplet is equal to two sigma over R sub V rho L T times the natural logarithm of the water vapor pressure E over the saturation vapor pressure E sub S of T of a plane surface of pure water. So last time in the physics of condensation, we came up with the Kelvin equation, which describes the effect of the curvature of the radius of a droplet has on the saturation vapor pressure above that curved surface of pure water. 
and we determined that the curvature effect uh, caused the saturation vapor pressure over that curved surface to be much greater than over a plain surface of pure water. And that's denoted by this exponential function uh, where you have a correction factor for the uh, saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of pure water. Uh, this correction factor is 2 times sigma, which is the surface tension of the water droplet, uh, R sub V, which is the uh, specific gas constant for water vapor, uh, rho L, which is the density of liquid water, T is the temperature, and R is the radius of the droplet. And what we usually do is we usually replace all of these uh, constants uh, with the constant A, where A is equal to 2 sigma over R sub V rho L T. And today what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the concept of the solute effect. So if we have a plain surface of pure water, where all of these blue circles represent water droplets, you have a saturation vapor pressure over a plain surface of pure water. If we introduce impurities into the water, uh, in this case represented by these uh, black squares, which are particles, and this could be salt, or it could be sulfate, or it could be uh, nitrate, or it could be any one of a number of particles that are present in the atmosphere, um, you'll notice that it actually reduces the number of water molecules that are on this interface between the water droplet and the air, and that will consequently reduce the uh, likelihood of evaporation from the surface. And so what that means is that the saturation vapor pressure uh, over a plane surface of a solution will actually have a less, uh, so the, the saturation vapor pressure over this situation will be less than the saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of pure water. And mathematically, uh, we can basically say that the saturation uh, vapor pressure over a solution droplet, which is what the prime denotes, uh, of, uh, as over a solution plane surface of uh, solution um, is equal to essentially the saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of water times a correction factor. And this correction factor is 1 minus the number of molecules uh, of solute relative to the number of molecules of the liquid. Um, and if we want to expand that into something that's more useful, the number of molecules of the solute is equal to the mass of the solute uh, divided by the molecular weight of the solute times Avogadro's number times I, where I is the Van't Hoff factor, uh, which talks uh, basically about uh, whether or not a given species is soluble or not. Uh, for example, if you have a silicon dioxide uh, mineral dust particle, uh, so this is a, a silicon dioxide, it's not water soluble, and so it's going to have a Van Hoff factor of 1. If you have a sodium chloride, when you put that into the water, it dissolves uh, in the solution and will end up with a Van Hoff factor of 2. If you have ammonium sulfate, NH, for 2 uh, SO4. Uh, when this goes into solution, you end up with two ammonium ions and one sulfate ion, and that will have a Van Hoff factor of 3. And so it really is looking at the number of ions that are available at this interface. And so this represents the number of uh, molecules, uh, or ions in this case, uh, that are present uh, at that interface divided by the number of uh, moles, excuse me, the number of molecules uh, uh, in that water droplet. But we know that the mass of the water droplet is 4 thirds pi r cubed rho L. Um, you multiply, you divide by the molecular weight of water and multiply by Avogadro's number, and you can get the number of molecules uh, that are uh, present there. And so mathematically, we can go ahead and rearrange that. You get 1 minus 3i the mass of the solute times the molecular weight of the water uh, over 1 divided by 4 pi, the uh, density of the liquid water times the molecular weight of the solute um, times uh, r cubed. And we usually uh, write this uh, in a simplified form that e sub s prime of t of infinity is equal to e sub s t of infinity times 1 minus b over r cubed, where b is this uh, constant that's out here in front of this. So you'll see 
that the presence of the solute reduces the saturation vapor pressure over that plane surface of uh, a solution droplet. But we can now put this solute effect, uh, combine it with the curvature effect, to get the saturation vapor pressure over a curved surface of a solution droplet, which is what we actually have in the atmosphere. So putting it all together. So we see that these curved surfaces make it more difficult for embryonic droplets to form. What we're going to find now is if we add impurities to the water, then it will actually make it more likely or it'll make it easier for embryonic water droplets uh, in order to be able to form uh, as a curved surface. And here we're going to describe this as e sub s of star, uh, the e sub s star uh, times t of r. And that e sub s of star actually means the saturation uh, vapor pressure of a curved solution droplet. So that uh, asterisk means that there are impurities in the droplet. Um, and once again, it's going to be E sub S of T, which is our water saturation vapor pressure as a function of temperature for a plane surface of pure water times a correction factor. And that correction factor in the numerator has an exponential term, which is the exponent of uh, a constant C1 over TR. Uh, C1 is 0.3338 K per millimeter. And then in the denominator, um, so the numerator is the curvature term. In the denominator, we have the solute term, which is 1 plus C2, which is a constant, 4.3 times 10 to the 12th millimeter cubed per gram, uh, times I, which is a Van Hoff factor, which uh, basically describes the ability of a given molecule to dissociate once it is put into the water. A, a non-water soluble uh, species will have a Van Hoff factor I equal to one. A species such as sodium chloride, which uh, breaks up into the sodium ion and the chlorine ion will have a Van Hoff factor of two um, and so forth. Uh, MS is the uh, mass of the solute, uh, capital MS, is the molecular weight of the solute. And then we have our R cubed uh, term for the solute term. So if you look at the image down below at the bottom, we have a pure water droplet uh, with intermolecular forces that are holding together the uh, water droplets. And you have a certain amount of evaporation, which is a function of temperature. And over on the right, we have water with a solute, and the solute is uh, demonstrated by the uh, red boxes. And what you can see is that the presence of a solute at the air-water interface actually takes up a place where a water molecule would normally be. Uh, and that reduces the number of water, the water molecules that are actually available um, for uh, potential evaporation across that interface. And this effect reduces the saturation vapor pressure over a uh, water with a solute in it. So putting it all together, we now have the saturation vapor pressure over a curved surface that is a solution droplet is equal to the saturation vapor pressure of pure water, uh, a plane surface of pure water, times a correction factor for the um, curvature effect, the exponent of A over R, times the correction factor for the solute effect, one minus B over R cubed. And to look at this graphically, we have R on this axis, we have the saturation ratio on this axis, where a saturation ratio of 1 is equal to a relative humidity of 100%. Uh, so this is the 100% relative humidity line. Um, e sub s of t of r, which is our curvature effect, this equation back here, Kelvin's equation, um, is basically like this. It's an exponential function that asymptotes out at the um, saturation vapor pressure, uh, excuse me, the saturation ratio of 1. And then we have the uh, solute effect, which basically always reduces the um, critical uh, saturation, the saturation ratio at equilibrium. And this is E sub S, the prime of T of infinity, which is given by this equation right here. 
but for our solution droplet, when we put it all together, you're basically adding these two lines together. And initially, it's the curvature effect that starts to have the overall influence on the uh, saturation vapor pressure over the droplet. But as you get to smaller and smaller radii, um, <clears throat> the fact that this is uh, R cubed versus R inside the exponent, uh, the solute effect starts to win. And there'll be an inflection point right here denoted by this dot, at which point the solute effect becomes the dominant term. And in fact, it drives the equilibrium saturation vapor pressure uh, for this system down below a saturation vapor uh, saturation ratio of one. And so the blue curve is the actual curve that equilibrium curve that our droplets experience in the Earth's atmosphere. And so what it does is by having a impurity in the droplet, it dramatically reduces the saturation ratio required for co the condensation process. Up here, it required an infinitely high uh, saturation ratio in order to begin the condensation process. But when you have an impurity, it no longer requires an infinitely high uh, saturation ratio. In fact, um, it can, the condensation process can actually begin at uh, saturation ratios less than one, which means at relative humidities less than 100%, you can actually have condensation onto particles in the atmosphere. And that's one of the ways that we can actually, one of the ways you can actually see this is on a day that has high humidity, high relative humidities, the visibility is much more poor than it is on days when it's dry. Because the particles that are there, that are water soluble at least, uh, are uptaking water and growing into what we call haze droplets. <clears throat> we define any droplet that has a uh, radius that is smaller than the critical radius, which is the inflection point in the Kohler curve. Um, this is what we call a Kohler curve. So any droplet that exists at equilibrium in the environment and has a radius less than the critical radius on the Kohler curve, we refer to as a haze droplet. And any droplet in the atmosphere that has a critical radius greater than the inflection point on the Kohler curve, we refer to as cloud droplets. So that is the boundary between cloud droplets and haze droplets. Um, and we're going to do a lot of uh, examples with the Kohler curve, uh, trying to identify what types of particles we uh, have the smallest uh, uh, critical uh, saturation ratio. Uh, if they have a small critical super uh, saturation ratio, then they're a very good cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, if they have a very high uh, critical saturation ratio, then they are not a very good cloud condensation nuclei. And we're going to be doing a lot of examples with that. And a very good mathematical exercise for you to do, in fact, I'll probably assign it as a homework, is to take this equation and rewrite it in its most common form, where E sub S of prime of T of R is approximately equal to the saturation vapor pressure of pure water over a plane surface of water times this correction factor, uh, one plus A over R minus B over R cubed. Um, and in order to do that uh, transformation, you're going to have to use uh, the series expansion for the exponential function. And just to recall, the exponential function of x is equal to 1 plus x uh, over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot 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 uh, out to infinity x to the n divided by n factorial. And that would be a really good... Here we have a Kohler curve, which is what we refer to uh, as E sub s of star of T of R. It's the saturation vapor pressure over a curved solution droplet. And what we have here is we have the curvature effect, uh, which is the dashed line uh, that goes uh, off the top of the chart. And then uh, compare that with the solute effect, which is the dashed line, which is heading towards the bottom. And you add those two effects together and you'll get the sum of both curves. And that is what we actually refer to as the Kohler curve. And that shows what the uh, equilibrium relative humidity is, uh, or the equilibrium uh, saturation value for a curved solution droplet as a function of droplet radius.
So once again, the equation uh, that we discussed before, E sub S of star of T of R, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to approximate it using a Taylor series approximation. Um, and uh, we, by doing that, we can make it a much simpler um, expression uh, that's actually still quite accurate. We now have in the simplified version of the Kohler curve equation, we have E sub S of star of T of R, which is the saturation vapor pressure of a solution droplet uh, is approximately equal to the saturation vapor pressure over a plane surface of pure water at temperature T times in brackets one plus the uh, curvature term A over R where A is that two sigma over rho L R V T and minus B over R cubed where B is three times the Van Hoff factor times the mass of the solute times the molecular weight of water vapor divided by four pi rho L, which is the density of liquid water, times the molecular weight of the solute. And if we were to try and figure out the critical radius and critical supersaturation, in calculus, you would just simply differentiate the equation and uh, set it equal to zero to find the uh, to find the place where the slope of that curve goes to zero. Um, and then by doing that and doing a lot of algebra, uh, we can discover that the critical radius, R star, uh, for this curved solution droplet to be in equilibrium with the environment is equal to three times the constant B over the constant A, uh, taking the square root of that uh, entire expression. And consequently, we can do the same sort of thing. Uh, and with the supersaturation and the supersaturation, the equilibrium supersaturation S star for a curved solution droplet is equal to 4A cubed over 27B, uh, the square root of that entire value. So we have this Kohler curve and we can try and interpret what it actually means. So <clears throat> what we have here is we have a relative humidity of the environment in this particular example of 100.3%. So that's the orange line in the chart. And droplet A is initially at uh, about uh, 0 0.12 uh, radius or 0 0.11 micrometers radius. And if it's subjected to this relative humidity of 100.3, um, it'll be supersaturated because the environmental relative humidity is actually higher than what is required for uh, a droplet in the position of A on the Kohler curve to be at equilibrium. So droplet A only requires a relative humidity of 100.1% to be um, at equilibrium, but the environment has 100.3, so it's super saturated. There's more water available uh, in the atmosphere than is necessary, and that will cause condensation to occur. And this droplet will grow until its Kohler curve intersects with the relative humidity of the environment. At that case, um, the droplet uh, will grow to a size of about 0 0.14 micrometers, and it will stop. Um, and it'll be basically at the location uh, where droplet B is at right there. Um, so if we look at droplet B, uh, the Kohler curve, according to the Kohler curve, it um, requires a relative humidity of 100.3% to be its uh, saturation. And that's exactly what it's being subjected to uh, from the relative humidity of the adjacent air. Uh, so it's at equilibrium with the environment, so it will not grow and it will not shrink. It's going to basically remain at that size of 0 0.14 micrometers. Droplet C on the Kohler curve, uh, requires about 104, 100.42 or so um, percent relative humidity in order for it to be 
in, at equilibrium with the environment, but the environment doesn't have 100.42. It's only got 100.3. So the droplet C is going to be subsaturated, and because it's subsaturated, it's actually going to evaporate. And it's going to evaporate until its Kohler curve intersects the uh, environmental conditions. And so a droplet, a 0.2 micrometer droplet of initial size will evaporate uh, down to a size of 0.14 micrometers um, there at the same position as droplet B. Uh, droplet D, on the other hand, is supersaturated because droplet D is about, uh, has a radius of about 0.75 or 0.8 uh, micrometers. And according to its Kohler curve, it only requires a uh, relative humidity of about 100.15. Uh, and the environment has 100.3. So it's supersaturated, which means that it's going to grow by evaporation. And as droplet D grows, you'll see that its Kohler curve is going to asymptote out down to 100% relative humidity. So as this droplet grows, it's actually going to become more supersaturated um, if the relative humidity of the air remains constant at 100.3. So droplet D is supersaturated and will continue to grow, and we'll refer to that as an activated cloud droplet because it's going to separate itself in size from the haze droplets, A, B, and C, which equilibrate down at about 0 0.14 micrometers, D will grow substantially larger than those haze droplets. So let's do this again. So uh, how will the droplets behave if the relative humidity increases to 100.5% instead of the 100.3%. So, at, if the environmental relative humidity is 100.5%, it doesn't matter uh, which droplet you're talking about, A, B, C, or D. Uh, they all, according to the Kohler curve, uh, require less relative humidity to be at equilibrium than what the environment actually has. So every one of those droplets, A, B, C, and D, will be supersaturated and will continue to grow and will, they will all become activated cloud droplets this time. So how will these droplets behave if instead the relative humidity decreases to 100% relative humidity? Well, all of those droplets, A, B, C, and D, they all require a relative humidity that is greater than 100% in order to be uh, in existence, uh, to be at equilibrium. So they're all going to have to evaporate to some degree. And so what's going to happen is they're going to evaporate and following the Kohler curve until the Kohler curve intersects the new environmental conditions in this case, 100% relative humidity. Uh, and uh, you know, droplet A will shrink uh, to about 0.11 micrometers radius. Uh, droplet B will shrink, will evaporate to the same as, as we'll see and as will droplet D. They all will evaporate down to a size of about 0 0.11 micrometers. And they will all become haze droplets and hang out at that size for a while.